This is CBN News Watch. We begin this half hour in the Middle East as fighting escalates in Gaza and along Israel's northern border. The U.S. and its air partners are working a blueprint with a firm timeline for establishing a Palestinian state if a Gaza ceasefire takes effect. But as CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us, that's a non-starter for Israel. After a call with President Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu again rejected the idea of recognizing a Palestinian state. Posting on X, formerly known as Twitter, he summed up his opposition in two sentences. Israel categorically rejects international dictates regarding a permanent settlement with the Palestinians. Such an arrangement will be reached only through direct negotiations between the parties without preconditions. Israel will continue to oppose the unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Such recognition in the wake of the October 7th massacre would give a huge reward to unprecedented terrorism and prevent any future peace settlement. The plan would include many steps rejected by Israel in the past, including evacuating many communities in the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, along with a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem and a combined government for the West Bank and Gaza. Israeli government spokesman Avi Hyman said it's not time to speak about the day after the war ends. Now is not the time to be speaking about gifts for the Palestinian people at a time when the Palestinian Authority themselves have yet to even condemn the October 7th massacre. Now is the time for victory total victory against Hamas. All discussions of the day after Hamas will be had the day after Hamas. Meanwhile, Israel criticized a United Nations official who told Sky News that despite its acts of terror, Hamas is not a terror organization, which is a position held by the UN. I think it's very difficult. And as you say, I've, I've worked with many, many, many different terrorists and, and, and insurgent groups. Uh, Hamas is not a terrorist group for, for us, of course, as you know, it's a political movement. Posting on X, Israel's UN ambassador Gilad Erdan blasted Griffiths, saying, you are no humanitarian. Sadly, you are a terror collaborator. Also, Netanyahu and other senior Israeli officials met with CIA Director William Burns in Tel Aviv to discuss talks for the release of the hostages. The prime minister earlier refused to send a delegation to Cairo for talks on Thursday until Hamas lessened its demands. Families of the hostages chained themselves together at the entrance to the defense ministry, calling for the war cabinet to send a delegation to Cairo. And in Gaza, IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari explained Israel's military mission in the Nasser Hospital in Gaza where Israeli intelligence believed bodies and hostages were being held. According to the information we have collected, I, I can now share some of the terrorists who took part in the massacre of October 7th. They were found by our forces inside the Nasser Hospital complex. If it weren't for Hamas starting this war, taking our hostages and hiding in the hospital, we wouldn't need to be in the hospital in the first place. Hamas started this war. Israel will end this war. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks so much, Julie. And you can see more news from the Middle East on the CBN News channel tonight at 8.30 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. Well, turning now to the emerging threat from Russia, the White House has confirmed that Moscow has obtained a troubling anti-satellite cut capability. CBN's Jenna Browder is following that story in Washington. Is Russia planning to put a nuclear weapon in space? That's unclear. The White House Thursday only calling it an anti-satellite capability. There is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. The administration working to calm fears and stressing that Russia's emerging new weapon isn't ready to go yet. This is not an active capability, but it is a potential one that we're taking very 
very seriously. The Kremlin is downplaying U.S. concern, saying it's a ruse to make Congress support aid for Ukraine. I think first we need a better understanding of what exactly the capability is. John Hardy with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies tells CBN's Faith Nation it's unclear if Russia is planning to put a nuclear weapon in space or just take down its satellites. Either way, he says Moscow's latest aggression speaks to its bigger goals. The Russians have long seen that, that space is really vital to U.S. military operations. And so they want to be able to take that away from us. It all came to light this week when House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner released an urgent message calling on President Biden to declassify information relating to a serious national security threat, leading to mixed reaction from Congress. I certainly would not have done it like that, but in any event, we are where we are at this point. He was absolutely right, absolutely right. And every single one of you as American citizens, I'd be thankful that you made the decision to do that. The Wall Street Journal editorial board arguing that Americans need to be aware of the potential threats. America is sleepwalking into a new age of military and homeland vulnerability, and political leaders need to tell the public the uncomfortable truth. Russia's ambitions to target critical satellites are a blatant violation of international treaties. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Well, this time of year, millions of Americans suffer from the so-called winter blues or the more serious seasonal affective disorder, also known as SAD. Medical reporter Lori Johnson tells us ways to treat it. In the winter, the amount of sunlight Americans receive drops by about five hours a day from the summer. Plus, cold winter temperatures often push us indoors, further limiting our exposure to the sun. All that reduced sunlight can take a toll on our mental health. In fact, an estimated one in four Americans who say they feel pretty good most of the year report feeling gloomy and lazy during the winter. Doctors say it's more common to feel this way the further north you live, and women report these symptoms more than men. It's kind of like hibernating, like slowing down, so sleeping more eating more, having lower energy. Experts say the lack of sunlight can reduce our levels of serotonin, a neurotransmitter which contributes to feelings of happiness. At the same time, it can cause overproduction of melatonin, a chemical that makes us feel sleepy. That's why a sun substitute can make a difference. I think light therapy is great. Unlike taking a medication, it is less likely to have side effects. Many doctors recommend sitting in front of a light box for half an hour in the morning. It's like sitting outside, sitting at the beach or under the sun. It doesn't emit any heat, but it's just a very bright light, kind of like the sun. It's kind of like your own personal box of sunshine. <laughs> a light box does not require a prescription. It should be specifically designed for light therapy and ideally have a power of 10,000 lux, which is 20 times stronger than the average light bulb. That can help the body regulate the mood a little bit better and it can help improve sleep at nighttime. Doctors warn against using tanning beds for light therapy. Most emit ultraviolet rays, which can damage the skin and lead to skin cancer. Experts do recommend exercise as a way to beat the winter blues. Moving the body pumps oxygen into the brain, making us feel more alert and energetic. It also releases endorphins, neurotransmitters that create a feeling of euphoria. Those with more severe cases might benefit from professional help. Some people may also choose to take an antidepressant medication to help their symptoms or to do some kind of talk therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy. For those counting the days until spring, these steps can not only improve mood, but increase energy and make winter more bearable. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Great tips. Well, coming up, some historic schools that were once for African Americans during segregation are in danger of disappearing. See what efforts are being made to stop this from happening. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. Welcome back. In the Jim Crow South, black school children were denied equal education. The lives of generations of those children were changed by the Rosenwald schools. 
Well, today, many of those schools are in danger of disappearing. Brody Carter reports on the efforts to preserve this pivotal part of American history. You're standing in the midst of history. Pine Grove Elementary, built in 1917, serves as a testament to the segregated educational system of the past. As one of the approximately 5,000 schools established across the South for African American communities, it symbolizes a vision of hope and progress. I walked three and a half miles one way. Muriel Miller Branch, whose father helped build this school, recalls her daily journey to Pine Grove Elementary. It was a safe haven and sanctuary for education during segregation. This is Jim Crow South, where everything is separate. Your worth as an African American was not valued. Before the Supreme Court ruled segregated schools unconstitutional in 1954, African Americans often had no access to public education or attended segregated schools in rundown buildings with makeshift desks. Buses of whites would pass by the blacks walking to school, spitting on them yep. and throwing things at them. That happened. Living in the Jim Crow era led to constant tension, making schools like Pine Grove Elementary part of the innovative Rosenwald Tuskegee Initiative, a transformative force in the education of black children. Education was like our faith. They went together. More than 5,300 Rosenwald schools eventually spread across the South as a result of the groundbreaking partnership between Sears and Roebuck founder Julius Rosenwald, a Jewish businessman, and Booker T. Washington, prominent African-American educator and founder of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Part of the pedagogy now of education began here. They're designed to blend in to the community. They're not designed to be ostentatious, not a lot of exterior ornament. They became targets sometimes for the, uh, the whites that were being that were jealous about African-Americans getting state-of-the-art schools constructed for them, but not for the whites. Sadly, many of these schools are being torn down and that history is being lost. That's why some nonprofits are working with architects to not only preserve this history, but also pave a path towards a more just future. Historic preservation architect Jody Lahendro is working with Miller Branch and her daughter, Sonia, through their family's association, AMMD Pine Grove Project, to revitalize the school and keep its memory alive. You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from. In Virginia alone, Rosenwald helped fund more than 360 schools. The State Department of Historic Resources says about a third still stand mainly because of community projects and family-led initiatives. It really does devolve down to the local community to go out and save the schools. Architectural and, uh, historian Mark Wagner with the Resources Department says development or demolition has caused much of the history to be lost. And grassroot efforts are crucial to saving those that remain to tell their stories. It got people into colleges. It elevated uh, the whole community and brought everybody up to you know, middle class. As for Pine Grove, it's been saved twice and may need a third rescue due to a proposed landfill approved by the state environmental board. Still, contractors are working to restore the school thanks to the project and the help of the next generation. You know, Martin Luther King didn't walk for nothing. Uh, you know, Mary Anderson, she didn't sing for nothing. Maya Angelou, she didn't write those poems for, any, for nothing. Um, all these people, they didn't do all these things for nothing for us to just sit here. Nashai Jean Davis and Kamira Holman have stepped up to champion the cause of preserving this old schoolhouse. Their commitment helping to honor a significant historical legacy while offering a chance to mend strained race relations. Our history is being erased out of textbooks. The story is being rewritten to fit the current narrative. And now it's my duty to instill these um, gems, these these truths to the next generations. It's, it's time to, to do the reparative, restorative work. I'm not just talking about restoring a building. I'm talking about restoring a culture, restoring people.
The Pine Grove Project is one among many initiatives emerging statewide and nationally to preserve black history. Now, it's an opportunity that we can use the lessons of yesterday that shape our present, fostering faith in a brighter tomorrow. I'm Brody Carter in Cumberland County, Virginia, CBN News. Great story. Thanks, Brody. Still ahead, we take a look at a new series that shows a different perspective of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Stay with us. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. MLKX is the latest installment of the National Geographic Genius Series, exploring the lives of both Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. And this take on their stories gives their wives a voice that we don't often hear. Ephraim Grant sat down with the actors who play Coretta Scott King and Dr. Betty Shabazz, along with two of the pivotal producers of the series. Reverend, Minister, why a story or a series about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X now? What's different about this one? Oh wow! I mean, there's it, you know the urgency of now is is why we're doing MLKX. Innocent black men are in prison. How many more have to be slain for America to say enough is enough? It's so relevant when we look at what's going on in our country right now. We can change the course of history. You know, when there's a concerted effort to um, silence us, to ban our books, to um, erase history. Malcolm, Martin, Betty, Coretta, their messaging, their commitment, their lives, doesn't even feel like a period piece. It feels contemporary it feels now and feels needed this is our reality now do you know what was the biggest surprise going into this in terms of the storyline i feel like there were so many things as i was watching i was like i had no clue what was the, the biggest surprise for you honestly there were there were so many things we went into this believing we knew a lot and before one word was written we put together a think tank of incredible journalists and authors and scholars and activists and religious leaders. And coming out of that, we were just floored by how much we didn't know. We haven't been oppressed. We are forced to ride the back of a bus so a white passenger could see. For both of you, was there an extra effort to humanize them even more? Because I think with distance, we almost deify them, and I, you know, forgot just how young all of them were. Yes, I mean, definitely wanted to show their their humanity, their, um, their fears and, and challenges, and and their level of commitment. Martin was 26 years old when he led the Montgomery bus boycott, and we didn't want to cast an actor 20 years older than that that moment. You know, we cast an actor who's in his 20s. Be careful. Evil looms over everything. So you play Coretta Scott King. Tell me about who you envision her as in relationship to Dr. King, certainly more than a wife. She definitely is more than a wife. She is his partner and his mm -hmm. equal. Mm -hmm. um, I am convinced wholeheartedly that he wouldn't be the man he was and wouldn't have done the things he did had he not had the foresight to have Coretta as his partner in life. So I'm glad that, you know, I'm part of this uh, project that is bringing light to the women and, you know, what they have done in order for these men to be who they are. Jamie, what was... Betty Shabazz's role, uh, what did you find in, in preparing for it? Malcolm wouldn't have had the longevity he had without her. And I think she, she made it uh, her duty to make space for him and to take care of him in a way that he can last. Because if he can't, then the movement, what he was fighting for, was, it was done. To fight against oppression by any means necessary. Many people will think, well, I know about Malcolm X. I know about Martin Luther King. Why now? <laughs> it's a dangerous place to get to when we when we feel like we've exhausted um, uh, revering our, or telling our history. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should be wary of that. We're in this together. How can I help you? 
it's not about the greatest hits. It's not about just the, the this speech or this march. We're getting the in-between. We're really getting to see them fully as human beings that come with insecurities and questions and, and doubt, right? All of what makes them to be the men and women that we come to learn about. And in doing so, I, I hope that people will walk away seeing themselves in Martin, Malcolm, Betty, and Coretta. I believe you're going to do great things. You must be a little daring. Going into this, did you have a hope for what you want this to do uh, for audiences? So often, you know, what we're taught that you need to choose between one or the other. Who do you align with, Martin or Malcolm? And what we know is that you need both, that they were two sides of the same coin, that they both had the same desire for not only civil rights, but human rights and the dignity and citizenship of us. I don't think you can understand who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was and his legacy without understanding the legacy of Malcolm X. To show that we need both of the men, both of these women, they were all four just integral to to us and to the movement. What you're doing is just, never question that. Because then we can find the Malcolm, Martin, Betty, Coretta within ourselves. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? Wow, he looks like Denzel, doesn't he? Well, Genius MLKX is now airing on National Geographic and also streaming on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Coming up, see a daring rescue for a pup named Bear. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. It's two paws up for a Lancaster County Sheriff. Deputy John Brady, along with other first responders, were called to a Nebraska pond where a dog named Bear had fallen through the ice and was quickly becoming a popsicle. Body camera footage captured the Navy veteran jump onto the ice with a rescue boat. Deputy Brady fell into the water as well, but was still able to pull Bear to safety. Well, that is all good news there. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.